Hi guys, welcome back to Infinite Possibilities, the podcast where we explore the lives of amazing people, their choices, challenges and opportunities. And today I have a very special guest, Ned. Thanks for having me, Karen. Thank you so much for being here. No, it's my pleasure. So Ned, what was the process of convincing you to be on my pod like? <laughs> well, Karen, I first heard about it back in our uni days. Oh, wow. You, um, you, were, you were the OG fam when I like um, presented my PowerPoint and it was just called, I have a podcast. I was an early subscriber. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I saw you had some amazing guests on um, and was keen to be a part of it. Wow. And so how are the nerves today since you're finally on? Nerves. Nerves are high. <laughs> no, sure, sure. no. Very happy to be on. Happy to answer any questions that you've got. Um, and yeah, looking forward to to see what happens. Yeah, amazing. Love the attitude. Guys, feel free to subscribe and come on the pod. <laughs> Be in a, you know, a subscriber like myself. Yeah. Get on the train early. <laughs> Sounds good. So Ned, we really, know, we really want to know what you do. So what's your sort of one minute introduction? So I'm a consultant here at KPMG based in Brisbane. The team that I work in is called KPMG Customer and we do a wide variety of different things uh, ranging from customer experience work brand, reputation advisory, customer intelligence. Personally, I do a lot of digital strategy work across a bunch of different sectors. Uh, we do customer journey mapping uh, and a bunch of other different things that really focus on the customer and uh, helping our clients you know, really dig deep into what their customers value and how they can you know, move forward. Awesome. So we really want to know how Ned got to where he is today. So we're going to go right from the beginning. Ned, as a kid, at 10 years old, 10 days old, what happened, Ned? 10 days old, I was uh, sent into open heart surgery. Um, before I was born, my parents knew that there was a problem with my heart. I had congenital heart disease and the surgery was called transposition of the great vessels. Uh, it sounds complicated, <laughs> it but does. I'll try and simplify it for you. Um, basically, blood is obviously pumped from the heart near to the lungs i believe to sort of get oxygen and then around the body um, my blood flows however didn't sort of operate like that i believe it sort of missed the missed the lungs a little bit didn't really get the required level of oxygen but was still going around my body so it just wasn't sort of up to i guess the the level that it needed to be so that required surgery to be fixed um, which happened when I was 10 days old at the Prince Charles Hospital. Um, but since then, all is good. I go back every year for checkups and uh, just yeah. to make sure everything's ticking along. Um, so no troubles there. Yeah, that's awesome and glad to hear. Glad you're still with us yeah. today. Thanks, Karen. Nice Happy to be here. Blessing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so do you know what the recovery process? You are only 10 days. Is it just like one month in hospital? Do you know? I think uh, there was definitely a little bit of time in the hospital. Yeah, um, sure. Because I was so I that picture, you were just a baby. Yeah, tiny, tiny little thing. Yeah. Um, I think you know there was a lot of uncertainty around what would happen. I know that I actually had a hole in my heart as well, which for a lot of people wow. that's a bit of an issue. But for myself and just the the condition that I had, it was actually a bit of a blessing because blood was still able to sort of flow freely. Um, so my parents took me home, and sort of family came over to sort of I guess in a way say goodbye in case I wasn't going yeah. to live during surgery. Um, and then following that successful surgery, yeah, I assume I spent like a little bit of time in hospital just recovering, um, waiting for the okay uh, before yeah. I went home and just lived like a normal kid. That's amazing. Must have scared your parents to death, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure it did. They, they knew before I was born that it was a problem. Yeah. Um, so I think you know, it wasn't, I guess, a surprise when, when I was born. Um, they sort of had, I guess, the processes in place and, and sort of knew what was, what the possibilities were. Um, but it all ended up okay. Yeah, okay, that's good. Yeah, and then tell me more about the rest of your childhood. What kind of child were you like growing up? Definitely um, out there, out there sort of, you <laughs> know, <are. laughs> yeah, in terms of, you know, uh, really open to meeting new people, trying new things. Uh, I, I love sport, I've always loved sport. Um, spent a lot of time outdoors, uh, playing with my siblings. I've got an older sister and a younger brother. Oh wow, um, the middle child syndrome. Ooh. Middle child syndrome, yes, which I'm feeling right now, to be honest. My, <laughs> my sister lives in Melbourne and my, my brother lives at the Sunshine Coast. So yeah, home alone, um, yeah. under the microscope. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I'm used to it, middle child syndrome. Yeah, living like an early child, got to do all the chores, man. Exactly, exactly. 
<laughs> yeah, that's cool. Um, and tell me more about how you sort of fit in the school environment. Were you very academic? I know you're pretty sporty. How do you sort of... Definitely, I had a mix. You know, I was no, I was no incredible sportsman. I was more <laughs> of a sports enthusiast, I call myself. Um, yeah, played, uh, played sport every term at school. Uh, you know, volleyball and cricket in term one, and then a lot of tennis and water polo term two, rugby term three, and then back to cricket and volleyball in term four. And as I sort of moved into senior school, I became a lot more serious with my schoolwork, um, but still kept a, a really good balance between, you know, sport and then academics as well. Yeah, wow, that, that's quite a lot of sports. So did you ever consider a future in being a sports superstar? Absolutely not. Um, <laughs> like I said, a sports enthusiast. And, you know, I'll, I'll keep playing sport for my entire life. I don't see myself stopping. Um, but no, never, never really considered the professional pathway. <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. And what about your popularity, Ned? <laughs> Mr. Popular. Outgoing, smart, sporty. Isn't that like a tick for success? Yeah, no, Mr. Popular. Um, no, no, I have some great mates that I forged um, throughout my time in high school who I'm still best mates with today. Um, that we, we, we still do a lot of things together, whether it be on the weekends or after work. A lot, a lot of the boys are working in the city at the moment, so that's a great way to catch up. Uh, and yeah, just, just grateful to have some really good friends. Yeah, that's awesome. And so when you're in like that high school and that sort of decision making phase, you know, when you were thinking about careers, what was sort of floating through your mind? A lot. My parents, uh, I guess it's the same for everyone re really, are the first sort of idea that people get of, of what's out there. You know, what do your parents do? Yeah. Um, my, both of my parents uh, weren't in business. Uh, my dad is a GP and then mum was a nurse. Oh, so the in that medical routes. in that medical field. And I always said, oh, if I was smart enough, I'd love to <laughs> I'd love to be a doctor and actually be a heart surgeon yeah, so I can, right. you know, do something along that those lines. But but now I just donate a bit of time to the <laughs> to the Heart Foundation <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> rather rather than being a, a heart surgeon. Um, I always was passionate about business. Never really started, you know, any little entrepreneurship ventures. It was more so just the idea of running businesses. And um, I was always interested in stocks and, and things like that. So that was sort of a passion of mine. And, and wherever business will take me is sort of where we'll go, I guess. Yeah, that's cool. And then also on a sidetrack, unrelated. So speech and drama. I saw you got a little certificate for grade eight. Tell yes. me more about that. That could have been a possible career route, I reckon. Yeah, I think... <laughs> I think, um, the, so yeah, the speech and drama uh, consists of, you know, writing speeches, presenting speeches, memorising them, uh, and just performing in front of an audience, um, and also performing one-on-one -on -one wow, with, uh, yeah, with an adjudicator to sort of, you know, pass these exams, which that one was, and I did, uh, what, eight years of it or so, um, and did an exam every year. It's run through the AME. AMEB, which I believe yeah. is the Australian Music, Music Examination Board. Perfect. <laughs> um, and yeah, got the, the letters, it's called, which is grade eight. And um, I think that really helped me in my sort of presentation skills, meeting yeah, new people sure. um, and sort of just being confident speaking to a crowd. Um, it's something that, you know, initially when my parents were, you know, making me do it, I was like, no, 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 <laughs> don't want to do it. Um, but now it's, it's something that I'll look back and go, yeah, that was really worth it because yeah. it's helped me a lot. Oh, that's so cool. And so was it an extracurricular where you'd go after school or was that something that you, like a class you took during high it school? It was, yeah, it was all extracurricular. Um, so sort of after school, I had a few friends that were doing it at the same time as well. So we would usually do the classes together. Uh, I finished grade eight, the letters in about grade 10 or 11, I think, mm. um, which, was, which was awesome. But yeah, all sort of after school. Yeah, that's cool. And I'm surprised that your parents got you onto that because, you know, I would expect that, you know, if their kid was really shy and introverted, not like, not like you, right? You said you were pretty out there when you were young. They might need that support. So why did they think that Ned, you know, speech and drama? I think, you know, even if you're sort of an outgoing person, you can always, you know, perfect skills. There are, a, I always think, you know, there's always someone who's better than you. At yeah. everything so why not sort of improve those skills from people who know more uh, and you know set yourself up 
early on. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, did you do any instruments? I did. Yeah, I, I, did. Was, I was expecting more like that, right? When I think of Amy B, I think of like, you know. <laughs> yeah, I did. I love music. Um, I, well, I've had lessons and done Amy B exams yeah. in the piano. Wow, what grade um, did you get up to? Oh, I was pretty low in the piano, about three or four. I sort of stopped that. <laughs> so your drama was better. <laughs> yeah, well, I stopped that to sort of do that. And I also played a lot of flute, believe wow. it or not. I was a bit of a flautist. Yeah. <laughs> um, which... You know, I don't know how I got involved in that one. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure you self-select at grade five, no? Something like that. But I don't know why I didn't select the guitar or something cool. Um, <laughs> not saying the flute's not cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you probably still have it at your house? I do. I oh, don't no, dabble no. anymore, but, um, you know. Something I, about a KPMG band, my yeah, needing a flutist? Yeah, maybe, maybe. I'll have to help out if, if need be. But yeah, did that, did that all through school and um, just another sort of good thing to, to you know, do, I guess. Yeah, wow, you must have been so busy, speech and drama, two musical instruments, sports, academics. I feel like the school that I went to really gave you a, a bit of a platform to, to do all those things. It was really encouraged yeah. um, all, throughout, all throughout my time there. Uh, I never really sort of focused too hard on one and forgot about the others. I tried to just keep it balanced. Jack of all trades. Oh yeah, something like that. <laughs> Jack of all trades, master of none, I think. But better than one, yeah. that's how it goes. <laughs> yeah, cool, so back to um, business. So um, when you thought of business in high school, were you sort of like, sort of decided about which majors you wanted to do or were you haven't thought sort of that far? Hadn't thought that far ahead. Uh, the business like subjects that I did at school were economics. Nice. Uh, and that's it, really. <laughs> um, I was definitely more of a humanities student than, yeah. than the maths. Um, but yeah, deciding my majors really only came in the sort of first, second year of university after I'd seen what's out there and tried to, to see what I liked. Yeah, that's cool. So tell me more about studying advanced business at UQ. Advanced business, that the inaugural cohort. Level. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The OG, right? The, OG. the first cohort to graduate from advanced business. Yeah, exactly. Um, I love the degree. I thought it was fantastic uh, and my majors were accounting, international business and business analytics. A great combo, I thought. Yeah, got a bit of everything. Did you have sort of like a favourite that you sort of leaned towards? Definitely business analytics. Uh, going into uni, I really hadn't had any exposure to data and analytics before. And as soon as I got into uni and started doing some projects in the space, I thought, wow, this is so applicable to everything that's going on in the world right now. Um, it's such an interesting space. It can, it, it's just something I really enjoyed and, and um, focused hard on it in my last few years of uni and ended up getting an internship here at KPMG in data and analytics. Wow, that's perfect. Match mm. made in heaven. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I just thought of Len. He was plugging our course, right? See, the next CEOs will be business analytics. Yeah, uh, so yeah we'll, we'll see. We'll watch the career <laughs> watch progression. Watch this space. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, a lot, lot of time, I think. A lot of time before that happens. <laughs> yeah, so tell me more about so that triple majors. So how did you sort of decide each major? Was it a process of elimination or...? I loved business analytics, like I said, so that was always going to be one of them. I, along with business analytics, was really interested in information systems, actually. Yeah, um, which is my major. Yeah, because I you know, knew that the whole idea of coding and data warehousing and things like that was a perfect link between the business analytics major. But personally, I thought, oh, I'm, I'm not the most technical person out there. I think I'm going to do something more suited to my strengths, which was international business. Mm. Uh, and I did some great subjects in there, really enjoyed it, uh, and originally, they were going to be the only two. I was going to go on exchange to Edinburgh. Wow, the dream. The dream that didn't happen, Karen. Because um, of COVID? Because no? of COVID. <laughs> yeah, so because of that, I decided to pick up a third major, which was accounting. <laughs> wow, enough said and done. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 accounting's very important, obviously, especially in the world of business, but it, it just wasn't, wasn't one of my favourites, wasn't for me, uh, but I think a really good sort of base to still have. Yeah, and how was that decision between accounting and finance? Finance for me was more so just a, a passion. I really enjoy stocks and, and trading, yeah. um, trading shares. It's something that my dad has always been interested in and we talk about a lot. Uh, but the reason why I went accounting as well was to sort of get an internship in a place like this. I, I felt uh, as though a lot of the people who were getting internships had accounting majors and accounting backgrounds and I thought, well, 
there's a key piece, of the, piece CPA, of the puzzle. That's you, CPA, here we go. Yeah. So I thought, <laughs> okay, well, I might as well do it, even if it's not for me. I thought, okay, it's going to be a good decision, which I think it was. Yeah, that's awesome. Nice. Also want to take another route. So French, when did this start? French started in school. Uh, in I was high school, right? In high school, yep. Uh, I was always encouraged by my parents to pick up a language and, and you know, go as far as you can with it. Um, and my choice was French. I, I did a little bit of Japanese early on, but then when I got into high school and, and middle school, I only focused on French and absolutely loved it. And in grade 10, I believe, between grade 10 and 11, over the Christmas holidays, I went to France for a three month wow, wow, French exchange. Solid. Yeah. Uh, still keep in touch with my host family. Amazing. They've come out twice to visit. Uh, my parents have actually been back to visit. Mm. Uh, I've got plans to go over there next year to catch up with my host brother again. Um, and my French got pretty good during that three months. <laughs> it's dropped off the ball a little bit now. Uh, an excuse to pick it back up, I think. Or maybe yeah. an excuse to go over and visit yeah. again. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Wow, and then you did like a DEF A2 diploma? What's yep. that? Yep, so that was just uh, me wanting to keep the French going during uni. Uh, I looked into doing a concurrent diploma yeah. at UQ. Um, heard some stories that they were pretty full on. Mm. So I thought, oh, with the triple majors, with you know me wanting to still enjoy the uni lifestyle, I thought, okay, I'll go to Allianz Francaise, which is yes. a sort of external French education uh, company, and did the A2 diploma. Uh, that was about a, maybe a couple, couple of month, months course um, yeah. it went for. And you know we, we studied the basics again and sentence structure, tenses, um, a bunch of different topics, took a test uh, and got the A2 diploma. And if I'm, if I'm feeling up to it, I might do the A1 diploma, which I think is the next step. Ah, oh, okay. So yeah, it goes backwards. So A1 is the highest. Yeah. And then I think it gets into B2 and B1, which is sort of the top, top level. Yeah, that's cool. And also tell me about what it, what it was like going to France. Cause as someone who studied French and sort of did similar ish, but never actually went to France. Yeah. What was that like? Unbelievable. <laughs> uh, I was so nervous. I don't think I've ever been so nervous when I arrived in France. Oh. I had a group of people doing the same exchange with me and we all sort of went into the, to the same train station. We all saw our families at the same time. And when I got over there, my French wasn't anything special, <laughs> but I could not for the life of me remember a single word. <laughs> I, I, was, I was so like nervous. My French family came up to me. I think all they said is bonjour, like yeah. hello. Yeah. And I was going, uh, <laughs> I couldn't say a single word. Um, but that changed really quickly. They were really warm and, uh, and welcoming. And in a couple of days, you know, I was back to my sort of normal self and really trying to immerse myself in their home life. And I went to school with my host brother and met all his friends oh, and awesome. had a really great time. Yeah, and I heard they have really long lunch times in France, yeah? Yeah, super long lunch times. <laughs> uh, it, it, was, it was great. It was awesome. And the croissants? Croissants were great. I got a croissant on my walk home from school every day. Oh, yeah. Delicious, delicious. Yeah, they were great. Yeah, that's cool. And what about in terms of like, you um, definitely like reached like a higher level in French than I ever did. So what was your sort of study process? I know it was quite a while back, but for me, my future self, when I want to pick up French again. <laughs> I think with most subjects um, and, and learning in, learning anything, I guess, is doing it every day. It doesn't have to be for hours on hours. It, all, all it has to be is half an hour every day of sort of repetition, really making sure that you understand the content. That's how I found, uh, like that was the best way for me to learn French. Uh, just continually reading, listening, mixing up the way I learnt uh, was, was really helpful. Yeah, that's pretty good. Nice. Moving on to internships. So you did have quite an impressive number of internships during your um, four-year degree. So tell me, what was your sort of first job? First job out of school? Oh, actually, yeah. What is? Yeah, what was your first job like ever? My first job ever <laughs> was at Empire Office Furniture. Wow, fancy. Yeah, <laughs> I uh, had just got back from schoolies and oh, okay. I um, started up at Empire Office Furniture about you know two weeks or so after school. So it was your own thing? No, 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 oh, no. This was a big, okay. yeah. This was a big uh, office furniture company based in Brisbane, um, and 
basically my job was to just, uh, I worked in the warehouse and we assembled furniture, we <laughs> unpacked uh, pallets of furniture and um, pretty much whatever needed to be done around the warehouse we did. Uh, I worked there for a couple of months during that summer holiday until uni started uh, and then I took you know, a couple of months off, didn't, didn't do much work during that first semester of uni. Following that, I started. I stayed in the furniture business, <laughs> and cool. I went to a company called Life Care Furniture, which are an aged care furniture supplier, Ooh. based on the north side. And I was there for almost three years, all through my uni degree. Uh, it was a great place to work. It was with a lot of my mates. Yeah. Um, I went to Perth. I went to Coffs Harbour, I went to Sydney, I went to the Blue Mountains, a couple of trips to the Gold Coast to go to aged care homes and install furniture for the week into those big, you know, multi-level aged care homes. Yeah. Uh, big containers would arrive and we'd unload the furniture, we'd assemble it and then we'd install it into the aged care home. Uh, and that was my job during uni for about three years. Wow, that's cool. What did you like and what did you not so like about it? I loved the... I loved the the camaraderie really. It was great working with my friends. <laughs> banter. <laughs> yeah, lots of banter. It was it was one of those, you know, warehouse jobs that got hot, got tired, you know, you you was a lot of physical labour, so you were pretty sore by the end of the day, but working with your friends was a really good way to get <laughs> through it. Um, and and the company was great. Uh, as they as they all started to figure out that we were studying business degrees, <laughs> towards the end of it we maybe spent I only worked about three days a week with uni, but for two of the days or so, we were out in the warehouse doing the unloading and the assembly. And then the last day we were all up in the office doing you know, accounting work, <laughs> um, sort of general order checking and, and ordering you know, items of furniture. Yeah. Um, so it was great to sort of you know, really get to see those elements as, as we went through the business and sort of worked our way up in a way. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah absolutely loved it there. Yeah, very nice. And then tell me more about being a VACI at BDO and then PwC and then KPMG and then here. So how did you, so, um, so when did you first start applying for vacation positions? Started applying for vacation positions uh, in the middle of about 2020, which would have been our third year. Yeah. I think, you know, that's the, the time to do them is your penultimate year. Uh, so applied for anything and everything really across a number of different sectors and, and roles. A lot of it was in this accounting space, a couple of it was in the sort of operation supply chain space uh, and was lucky enough to get a first one at BDO in business services. I did on a day-to-day -day basis sort of tax returns for high income individuals, mm -hmm. sort of small family businesses, um, trust funds, different things like that. The team specialised in uh, automotive businesses, so car dealerships uh, and things like that. We also did a bit of sport tax for, you know, sport teams and things mm, like that. That's cool. Mm. That was for four weeks over the Christmas holidays. Ooh, not bad. And how was the interview process like? Any tips for future vacationers in general? Interview process, you've got to be yourself. I think really show your passion is a key one. Um, you know, people want to work with people who are passionate about the topic uh, and, and demonstrate that they're just going to give it their all. That'd be my biggest piece of advice. And yeah. come prepared. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's cool. And I'm surprised that like you didn't apply for business analytics internships or I, I, I did, I did. did. Um, there, it was just a competitive process. So yeah. the ones that I got were sort of just the ones that I got. Yeah. Um, yeah, BDO and business services and then PwC and corporate tax. Yeah, I was like, ooh, tax boy turns. <laughs> Yeah, it comes from my, you know, accounting major. Um, <laughs> the major you picked up during COVID. Wow, what luck. <laughs> yeah, the COVID major. Um, uh, another internship that I absolutely loved. I thought the culture at PwC was fantastic. Really enjoyed it. It was such a good team. Uh, really amazing clients that we were working with. Um, and a really good structure. I felt that everything ran really smoothly. Uh, the only thing was the work wasn't really for me. Yeah. Uh, it was quite law heavy, uh, which was something I wasn't really expecting. Um, and I'd actually done the internship in Digital Delta the month mm. before KPMG. So, oh, before? Yeah, so I'd had the taste of data and analytics in the workforce. Yeah. Then went to tax and, and you know, knew that 
sort of the data analytics space is where I wanted to end up. Yeah, that's cool. And on your LinkedIn, it says you did them back to back, right? Um, KPMG, Jan to March, and then PwC, March to April. Yeah, yeah. So I did the PwC internship uh, in the first few weeks of semester one of year four, mm. uh, which was which was really great. I was doing an income tax law subject at the same time. <laughs> Perfect. So, so that helped. Uh, and yeah, that was a busy few months. Yeah, and I'm surprised that it was during like off peak season. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I was I was lucky to be able to you know liaise with the people at PwC involved in in getting to those things both, organized. Right? Yeah, to be able to do both, so I was really lucky there. Yeah, that's awesome. And then tell me more about like after being a vacation at KPMG and then working undergrad. Again, yeah, that was another lucky lucky opportunity. Um, the way that that worked was I did six weeks unpaid work experience here at KPMG. Six weeks unpaid? Yep, Ooh. six weeks unpaid. Uh, and then following that, uh, I was offered undergraduate work. Um, and I pretty much accepted it, still having that PwC internship to go. Oh. I said to my director, I said, look, I've, I've got this opportunity at PwC, I'd love to go and do it. 99% chance that I'll come back and, yeah. and take you up on the undergraduate offer. And she said, absolutely, you know, go see what's out there, um, work hard at the PwC internship. Oh, and that's brilliant. We'll see you in a month's time, um, which is what happened. Yeah, that's cool. And then surprise about the six weeks unpaid. So was it um, when you were vacationer, I remember getting paid when I... <laughs> so my, my first bit at KPMG wasn't, you know, the vacation program, ah. it was, yeah, work experience. The way that I got involved first at KPMG was was through a sort of mutual connection uh, who was in a team here that I had no interest in, in being a part Hilarious. of. Hilarious. Um, but I was going through that interview process and going through that application process and wanted to learn more about the firm. So I reached out to him and said, hey, can we catch up? I'd love to pick your brain about KPMG yeah. and, and see what it's all about. Uh, and he said, absolutely. We met across the street had a coffee and I, I talked about my passion for data and analytics and how it was a space I really wanted to get involved in. Um, and he told me, look, I don't do any work in this space, but I know someone at KPMG who does. A week later, I met up with her uh, and asked if there was any work experience opportunities, which she said, absolutely there are. Uh, and in a couple of weeks time, I started up doing the work experience program. Yeah, that's amazing. And I think that's all, like, you know, a lot of people, they just see that like vacation route or like X, Y, Z to go through the sort of main portal, but like sort of networking, sort of being curious, that's also like kind of like another alternative. Yeah, I think it comes back to what I said before of just showing your passion. Yeah. Um, you know, there are a lot of people out there, I think, who just apply for internships for the sake of them, which, yeah. you know, initially I'd have to admit I was probably doing as well. Yeah, we um, all were, Ned. Yeah, so, you know, I think once you once you get those opportunities presented to you, you know, finding your passion and, and really showing that you care is a, an important step. Yeah, that's cool. And so any memorable experiences from all three internships? <laughs> Worked on some really cool projects. Um, the KPMG one, I was doing some cool work with Queensland Health around COVID. Oh, that's um, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Saving lives. Yeah, saving <laughs> lives. Um, PwC, I did some you know, tax work on, on big ASX listed clients. Um, BDO, it was around Christmas time, so we had a lot of Christmas parties and things. And yeah. uh, my love for sport uh, was, was sort of perfect because we did a lot of sports tax, like I said. Uh, so that was great exposure. Yeah, that's cool. Now let's talk about KPMG and your role here. So sort of want to um, introduce a little bit of the day in the life, the pros and cons. Day in the life. So I was in early this morning. I was in at about quarter to seven this morning, only because uh, I am working with a Sydney team, uh, yeah. a bit of daylight saving, savings going on. So I needed some answers quickly <laughs> for a project that I was working on. So I got in uh, just to send those messages. Um, but nine times out of 10, I'm, a, I'm in at about eight o'clock. Um, oh, that's, yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, 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 I feel like that's sort of the good time for me. Uh, and gives me a little bit of a time to sort of get settled in and see what I've got on for the day. Um, and then sort of straight into your project work, really. I, we have a stand up every day just to sort of set goals, um, see what blockers there are, and it's a great way to sort of maintain and keep track of your progress. 
Yeah, that's cool. And what are the sort of pros and cons of your job? Pros, definitely the people. I love who I work with. Uh, it definitely makes the days um, really, really enjoyable. Uh, the scope of work that I get to do, you know, I'm, I'm working on an ESG project now. Last week I was on a transport client uh, and the week before that I was doing um, sort of internal change management. So every day is different. Um, Quite every, a variety. Yeah, huge variety. Uh, every project's different um, and that's a real blessing, you know, being able to see what's out there and just get as much experience as I can. Uh, the cons, not, not, it's not too many to be honest, you know, there, there are times when everyone has to work hard obviously, so, so sometimes the hours can be a bit long, um, <laughs> but you know, if you're working long hours on a project that you're really passionate about, it's not too bad. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Any pro, um, favourite projects so far? Favourite projects? Um, during my internship here, I really enjoyed that Q Health work. Mm. Um, I have also the project that I just mentioned, the yeah. transport client. Um, I'm passionate about people with disabilities and helping them and this was a project, a digital strategy project that helped um, this particular transport client digitise the way that subsidies are given to people with disabilities to ride taxis. Um, for a long time, taxis uh, have accepted paper vouchers from people with disabilities. For example, if I had a disability, I would have a paper voucher. I'd submit it to the driver at the start of my trip. Yep. The trip would then happen. The driver would hand that to the uh, provider, taxi provider, who would then hand it to the government. The government would then pay the provider and so on all the way back until the driver got his money about six weeks later. Mm, so it was a really yeah. long process. It was really prone to fraud uh, and they were looking to upgrade it. So they got a smart card solution. Uh, which was which was great, but with the introduction of rideshare and um, you know payments that happened through the app, people with disabilities weren't able to physically tap this new smart card in the cars, uh, and our job was to help them you know part the way forward to become provider neutral was the term, so people with disabilities could access any kind of transport that they liked and still receive the subsidy. Yeah, that's amazing. You really don't sort of consider that from that sort of perspective. No, and we had a lot of personas to go through of people yeah. that were blind, people that were deaf, yeah. people that were paralysed, people relied on carers, yeah. just things that you take for granted every day you had to consider. Uh, it was a really interesting project and a really, I guess, feel-good project because yeah, you're, really, for sure. <laughs> you're, really, you're really making a difference, uh, which, was, which was really exciting. Yeah, that's cool. And let's talk about like the skill set that you sort of need for your job. Is it very um, technical? Do you do a lot of Excel grinding? Or if someone were to like, like you know, consider your team at customer, like, hmm, what, like you know, would I fit the mold or per se? The biggest or the most important skill I think that you need is just being able to simplify the complex. Ah, uh, that's a good one. Is is it just that's the essence of the job, really? You've got complex problems and you need to make them simple. Uh, being able to articulate that clearly is, is really important. Uh, so communication skills, literary skills are really important, probably more so than the technical skills and the work that I do. Um, they're, they're, they're really important. Um, and just having that sort of clear, clear mindset is a, is a really important skill, I think. Yeah, that's good. And also, Ned, how do you manage stress? It's a good question, Karen. I don't think it's something I've mastered yet. Um, definitely working on it. Uh, the past couple of months have been really busy, probably the busiest so far in my working career, just with sort of back-to-back -back projects going on. So dealing with stress has become more important than ever. Um, I think rest is crucial. If I'm not getting enough sleep, then I'm a mess, you know, yeah. I, I have to get sleep, I have to eat well, uh, just to be able to sort of function. Um, they're two key bits, uh, or two key tactics I use to, to manage stress. I've also started getting up a bit earlier and just doing a bit of, you know, I wouldn't call it meditation, but just sort of listening to some music and just trying to get in a good headspace for the day. Sounds good, something I should try. I would recommend it. I've <laughs> yeah. definitely noticed a bit of a change. Yeah, definitely sort of more clear-minded, ready to, I guess, get about everything and it's just a great way to start the day. Yeah, that's so good because they say like the first 10 minutes is the most crucial, right? You set like the tone for the day or whatever. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I feel like uh, another tactic that I always remember is 
um, I can't remember the number exactly, I believe it's 60,000 60, or so seconds in a day, for example, um, it's around there. If someone annoys you or you have a sort of stressful moment for 10 of those seconds, you can't let it bother you for the next, what, 59,990 yeah. <laughs> seconds. You have to, you know, say, okay, that's happened. I've got to move on because I don't want to let that influence me for the entire, like, for the entire day. Uh, it's something that I always yeah, try to remember. Yeah, that's good. It's like breaking it down. Because like, if you were like, oh, 24 hours, you know, just 24, but it's just, yeah. It just it's a lot of seconds. Number. Yeah. Because you really think about it. If, if something like that happens on a, during a day, it really does only happen for 10 seconds. Yeah. You read an email, you go, oh no, what's, what's that mean? And then you fixate on it. Yeah. But sort of realizing, okay, that's sort of 10, 20 seconds. You can't think about it all the way through till dinner. Yeah. It really puts it in perspective, I find, and it's a good thing that I try and remember. Yeah, that's a good tip. Thanks for sharing. Uh, that's okay. <laughs> cool. So we're nearly at the end, so we got the final deep questions. Ned, what's the meaning of life in your opinion? <laughs> meaning of life, it's something I think about a lot, to be honest. Um, happiness, for sure. Like, you've got to be happy. Yeah. What's the point if you're just miserable the whole time? Um, that would be my number one. Just finding the things you're happy. For example, that's golf for me. Yeah. I, I love that and it's a great way to de-stress as well. Um, friendship as well. Uh, having, having good friends makes you happy um, and family ties into that as well. So I think happiness is, is definitely, definitely up there for me. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So Ned, if you won the lottery tomorrow, what would you do differently about your life? Another question I think about a lot. Perfect! Get those lottery tickets early. Yeah, it, I always said to my mates, back in my furniture days, we, uh, every day we'd rock up and we'd work hard for about an hour and we'd be sweating and tired and you'd look up at each other and go, $10 million, you've won it tomorrow, what do you do? Oh, um, so I personally, I think it's a, it's a similar answer. I'd save a bit because, you know, the smart yeah. thing to do. Yeah. I always say that I'd never tell my mates that I won the lottery but what I would do is book a fully like all expenses paid golf trip up the west coast ah, of America beautiful. and um, you know we we get the nicest cars the nicest restaurants the yeah. nicest hotels um, <laughs> and I'd pay for it all and invite my mates along but I wouldn't tell them I've won the lottery I'd just say hey um, do you want to come on this trip Got a big bonus this <laughs> year <laughs> yeah so I'd definitely do that after saving the majority of it um, and I'd also give a lot back to my family, I think, considering yeah. how much they've given me over the years. Yeah, that's cool. Just wondering, why wouldn't you tell your mates, man? <laughs> because they'd keep coming back. Yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, I, think um, I say to the same, the same to my brother, look, I'm not going, I probably might not give them, you know, a couple of million. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but what I'd do is, you know, pay for a lot of fantastic experiences. Yeah. I'd love to take my mates on holidays, take my family on holidays and, and sort of just... <laughs> just got an endless wallet, Ned. Well, like, we don't know where it's coming from. <laughs> I think they, they might be able to guess where it's coming from. But, but yeah, I think I'd rather, uh, you know, just provide some experiences and, and really get out there and see the world with, with some of the, the money that I got from the lottery <laughs> rather than just giving it away. Yeah. I think it's a bit more meaningful. Yeah, that's true. Cool. If my mates don't want to come... They're, they're lost. They're lost. <laughs> Sounds good. So the final question is, what, what is an ideal day in the life for you? Can ideal day in the work, life. can be personal. Yeah. Um, we'll go personal because, you know, work's great. Um, <laughs> but a lot of the activities that I really enjoy uh, don't happen on the work days. Um, Fair. Not the podcast interview. <laughs> <laughs> this has been up there, Karen. Um, so I would stick with my, my new mantra of getting up early. Mm. Um, try my best to sort of get up and get in the right headspace and uh, I love coffee I love going out for brekkie <laughs> so that would definitely be where it starts um, then I'd probably round up the mates and head straight to the golf course nice. um, for, for 18 holes before having a nice lunch with them um, a bit of a, a bit of a snooze a bit of TV watching is, is always yeah, nice as well before probably going out again with some friends and, and um, wow and you a are time. social Ned <laughs> well it makes me happy yeah <laughs> meaning of life right yeah 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 that's pretty good well hope you get to do that this weekend hopefully I'm Oktoberfest uh, party this weekend <laughs> so <laughs> it should be great yeah okay well enjoy and thank you so much for being on the podcast say bye thanks everyone bye